Hi everyone. Today we will we are looking at the topic water and in this topic we will focus on water as a solvent. So we will look at the different properties of water and how they cause water to be a solvent and also how water plays different roles in different living things as a solvent. So let's look at oceans. So when you look at oceans, when you go to a beach and you look at the sea, you might just think that it's plain water. But if you taste it, you will feel that it tastes salty. And why is that? Because salt are dissolved in the ocean water. So in ocean waters are not pure, they are actually mixtures. So they are mixtures that contains large quantities of dissolved substances such as salt. Because when you taste the ocean water or sea water, you will find that it tastes salty. So these um, oceans and sea water have different uh, large quantities of different um, um, substances dissolved in them and that's why oceans and seas water are called solutions because they are not pure water. So let's look at a more examples of solutions where water plays a major role. For example, blood. So blood has 90% water. So blood uh, content of blood plasma is 90% water. Stomach acid also contains water. Sap in plants, again, it is water and glucose that the plant produces by photosynthesis is used to carry, um, uh, carry around the plant using the sap, which is water. So glucose is dissolved in the sap. Also beverages like coffee and lemonade. So when you're making coffee, what do you do? You add water, you add coffee, plus you add sugar and milk. So you're forming a homogeneous mixture of coffee. So coffee is a solution because you're adding different substances to it and all the substances are dissolving and giving you the coffee that you drink. Therefore, coffee is a solution and also lemonade. So how do you make lemonade? You have water and then you add lemon juice to it and sometimes you also add sugar to it. And they all mix together and form a homogeneous mixture and hence lemonade is also a solution involving water. So let's look at simple solutions. What does simple solution mean? Simple solution basically means that it is a solvent that does the dissolving and the solute that is dissolved. Now what does that mean? So if water is a simple solution and you dissolve sugar in it, so water is the solvent because it does the dissolving. So this is the uh, solvent that is dissolving the salt and a solute that is dissolved. So salt is something that is dissolved in a water. So simple solution is a solvent that does the dissolving and a solute that is dissolved. Now let's look at the role of water as a solvent in our body. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are dissolved in blood plasma and are carried around the body. And as I've been telling from before, that blood plasma consists of 90% water. So 90% of your blood plasma is just water and substances such as oxygen and carbon dioxide dissolve in that blood plasma and are carried to different parts of our body. For example, oxygen is carried to the cells the, uh, around your body, so different parts of your body has different types of cell. So the oxygen will be carried to your cell and then the cell will carry some metabolic reactions such as respiration. And uh, we all know that one of the waste products of respiration is carbon dioxide. So what the cell will do is the cell will give out the carbon dioxide which will again be dissolved in the water, in the blood plasma, and then they will carry that carbon dioxide to our lungs and then we will breathe that carbon dioxide out. So in that whole procedure, you can see the importance of blood plasma because this is the main thing that carries the substances around the body for it to be used so that our body functions properly and also for waste to be discharged so that we don't get poisoned. Also sodium and potassium ions are found in our body. So what happens is sodium and potassium ions 
uh, are dissolved in cellular fluids, which again contains water. And in, uh, so the cellular fluids are found in our nerves, and these are actually used for conduction of nerve impulses. So when you have a nerve impulse, for example, you put your hand on fire, and you have an impulse of uh, taking your hand back immediately. This is because your hand feels a, a warm sensation, and that sense is carried by your sodium and potassium ions to your brain, which tells your brain that you have touched something hot and you need to move your hand. So that's how your nerve impulses work. And the main ions involved in your nerve in impulses are sodi sodium and potassium ions, which are dissolved in water. Now let's look at a different living organism, such as a plant, and how water plays a role in our plants. So green plants make glucose by the process of photosynthesis, and that glucose is dissolved in water because if you remember that photosynthesis occurs in the leaf, but the whole plant needs glucose to survive. So the plant's leaves, the plant's stems, the plant's root, all different uh, parts require supply of glucose. So what the plant does is the plant dissolves the glucose in water and then water transports it to different parts of the plant such as the stem and the roots. And when water is dissolved in, uh, sorry, when plants uh, uses the water as the solvent, it is called aqueous sap. So water as a solvent is known as aqueous sap in plants. Also with our body, if you remember that we have urea and other metabolic waste because our cells are continually doing metabolic reactions and that uh, forms some uh, waste such as urea and many, uh, many other things and those are dissolved in aqueous bodily fluids such as blood plasma or lymph fluids and they are transported to our excretory organs. For example, urea is discharged as urine you know, from your body and if you remember that urine is liquid and why is it a liquid? Because the urea is dissolved in aqueous uh, bodily fluids which contains water and then they take it to your bladder and your bladder discharges it. So uh, your bladder is your excre excretory organ. So your bladder discharges it and that's how water again plays an important role because it allows us to get rid of our waste formed in our body through metabolic reactions. Now let's look at two new um, words, saturated and unsaturated. So there are two types of solutions, saturated and unsaturated solutions. Now what do each of them mean? So a saturated solution means that one in which, in which no more solute will dissolve under the existing temperature and pressure. So no more. What does this mean? When you take a glass of water and you put salt in the first time, it will dissolve. But you keep putting salt in over and over the time, so you're continually putting salt in. At one point, the salt will start, stop dissolving and it will appear like that. So it will be present as salt crystals in your solution. And why is that? Because your solution has become saturated. It has lost its ability to dissolve more solute because it already has, because it already has the amount of solute that it can possibly dissolve and it cannot dissolve any more solute than that amount. Therefore, it cannot uh, dissolve more salt, so your salt crystals appear in a solution. So your solution becomes saturated, and that means that no more solute would dissolve in it under the existing temperature and pressure. So again, during this experiment, you have to make sure that you are using the same temperature and pressure throughout, that your temperature and pressure does not change throughout your experiment. So you have to uh, keep these uh, values constant. Now what does unsaturated solution mean? So as the name suggests, unsaturated solution contains less quantity than the quantity of solute needed to saturate it. That means that when you first add salt to your water, it dissolves because it is still unsaturated. You have not added the maximum amount of solute your solution can contain. That's why it can, uh, um, it can dissolve more solute, but at one point it won't be able to dissolve more solute and at that point it becomes saturated, 
but initially it is an unsaturated solution because it has the ability to dissolve the solute. So, if a saturated solution of sugar in, uh, in water at 25 degrees Celsius was heated to 50 degrees, so again notice that you are increasing the temperature from 25 degrees to 50 degrees which means that your solution is getting hotter and what happens as a result? As a result you can dissolve more sugar. So at 25 degrees Celsius you dissolve a certain amount of sugar and then it becomes saturated which means that you cannot dissolve any more sugar than the quantity you already added. But if you increase the temperature to 50 degrees your solution becomes hot and that causes the su more sugar molecules to dissolve. So for example, at, if at uh, 25 degrees Celsius, if you added 100 grams of sugar and then you increased your temperature to 50 degrees Celsius, you can add for example 110 grams. So you are adding 10 grams more of sugar because you are changing the condition of temperature during your experiment. But if the solution was then carefully cooled back to 25 degrees, additional solute may remain undissolved. Now, after you have increased the temperature, you could dissolve more sugar. But what happens when you go back to the initial temperature of 25 degrees Celsius? The extra sugar that you dissolved in your water will precipitate out. So whatever you dissolved extra after you made it hot will again come out of your solution because your solution goes back to its initial temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So what does that mean? It means that if we increase the temperature of our solution, it has the ability to dissolve more solute without getting saturated. But if we bring it back to its initial temperature, it will crystallize out the extra solid that you added when it was too hot. Now let's look at supersaturated solutions. So this is again another new word. So what does supersaturated mean? So supersaturated solution contains more solute than saturated solution. So these kind of solutions can uh, have the ability to dissolve more solutes than normal. They can dissolve more solid substances, so more amount of sugar for example than a normal solution can. So that's what supersaturated mean and they can act, uh, actually do that in a, a normal room temperature, so 25 degrees Celsius and normal room uh, pressure. So these are the solutions that can hold a large amount of solute in existing set of conditions. And some are relatively stable, which means no matter how much you add, the solution will never crystallize out. So even if you change temperature or pressure, because they are so stable, this uh, extra added solid will never crystallize out. But again, some are unstable and that means that presence of dust or addition of a small quantity of solid solute will cause the extra solid that you added to crystallize out. So for example, if you have a super saturated solution that is not stable and you added lots of sugar to it and all of that sugar dissolved. But now, if you add, for example, dust particles to the um, solution, that will, um, that will um, interfere with the uh, mixture, equilibrium mixture, and that will actually cause some of the extra added sugar to crystallize out because there is an imbalance of the sugar crystals and the dust uh, particles. Therefore, it makes the solution unstable and it crystallizes out both the sugar and also the dust particles. Now what does solubility mean? Solubility means the ability of a substance to dissolve in a um, solution. So, the, so uh, there are different substances can exhibit different solubility. So different sub substances have different ability to dissolve in a, sub, uh, in a solution. So um, for example, in water, so if water is our solvent, we will see that different types of substances have different solubilities. For example, salt can readily, is readily soluble, so when you put salt in water, it dissolves very quickly. You do not need to do a lot of work to dissolve your salt. 
but if you add oxygen to your water, it is less soluble. So that means that when you add oxygen to water, not all of it will dissolve, only a little bits and pieces of it will dissolve, but not all of it will dissolve. And with sand, virtually nothing uh, dissolves, so everything remains insoluble. So insoluble means that something that remains as a precipitate or as a solid in your solution. So for example, in the picture you can see that when, you, when we added the sand to the beaker of water, the sand remained as the sand particles. They did not change, nor that they, they disappeared or they dissolved. Hence, sand is insoluble. Now, you are probably thinking why? So in our next few lessons, we will look at what mechanisms are involved in dissolving substances in water and how they determine that whether they are soluble or less soluble or insoluble. So it is the forces in these particles that determines whether they are soluble or less soluble or insoluble. Now let's look at the solubility of different substances such as gas. So gas, you can see that um, ammonia is very highly soluble in water and you can um, add ammonia, you can form an aqueous solution and then you can use that to clean floors and ovens for example. So ammonia readily dissolves in water. You put ammonia in water and that's it, it's going to make um, um, aqueous solution. What about carbon dioxide gas? Carbon dioxide gas is very slightly soluble. So when you add carbon dioxide, all of it does not dissolve, only, only a small amount of carbon dioxide dissolves, so therefore it's slightly soluble. And what about hydrogen? Hydrogen has very low solubility. That means that hydrogen does not dissolve in water at all. Therefore, uh, in gases you can see that ammonia is the most, uh, um, uh, has the highest solubility in water, and then carbon dioxide, and then hydrogen. Now let's look at a different state, for example liquid. Now liquids, alcohols have a high solubility in water, so when you put an alcohol, alcohol in water, they will be easily soluble. But when you put an olive oil in water, they are not very soluble, so their solubility is low. They remain as insoluble. So for example, when you take a beaker of water and you add oil, olive oil to it, you can actually see two different layers forming. The top layer would be your oil and it will appear yellow and the bottom layer would be a pure uh, water. So you have two different layers forming and why is that the case? Because olive oil is insoluble, it does not dissolve in water, therefore it forms its own separate layer because it's insoluble. And what about solids? As you can see, different types of solids also have different types of solubility in water. So calcium nitrate will readily dissolve in water because it has a high solubility. Calcium sulfate, on the other hand, has a slight, solu uh, slight solubility in water. So again, not all of it will dissolve, only some parts of it will dissolve. And what about calcium carbonate? Calcium carbonate also has a low solubility because you can actually see calcium carbonate as a white precipitate in your water. So calcium carbonate is an insoluble white solid. It does not dissolve in your water. Now, from this table, the main idea you get is that different substances have different amounts of solubility. Also, one, of, uh, one uh, other thing you should notice that the state of a substance does not determine its solubility. So it does not matter whether your substance is gas, liquid or solid, all kinds of substance dissolves in water. So there must be some other properties that determine that whether these, those substances are soluble in water. And we will look at, this, uh, at those properties in our following lessons. But as you can see that the state of a substance does not uh, determine its solubility. So uh, different types of gases have different types of solubility in water, so does liquids and solids. Now this brings us to, end of our, uh, to the end of our theory session. Let's look at some questions to test your knowledge. Question 6. Now question 6 tells us to explain the differences between compounds, mixtures and solutions. Now, you have to remember that the verb here is explain. 
That means you have to uh, t explain, so you have to tell the cause and effect relationship. So why these compounds, mixtures and solutions are different to one another. So you have to describe the cause and what causes them to be different from one another. Because the question is again asking about the differences. So you have to talk about the properties in detail uh, that makes compounds, mixtures and solutions different from one another. So let's look at what a compound is. A compound is a pure substance made up of two or more elements combined in a fixed ratio. So when two types of elements combine together, together you get a compound. For example, when carbon and oxygen, so carbon and oxygen are two different elements, when they come together you get carbon dioxide gas. So, and carbon dioxide gas will be your compound. Now let's look at what a mixture is. A mixture can be made up of many substances in a range of compositions. So a mixture is something where you put different types of substances together in a range of composition. Again, notice that a mixture is not made up of elements, it, uh, it is made up of compounds. So when you put different types of compounds together, you get a mixture. For example, air. Air is a mixture but it has different types of compounds such as carbon dioxide, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, water vapor. So it has different type of compounds coming together and then it's forming the mixture. So you can already see that compounds are, are the difference between compounds and mixtures. And what about a solution? A solution is a mixture but in this case it's a homogeneous mixture. What does that mean? It means that it has a uniform composition. So air is a homogeneous mixture because no matter what part of air you collect, they will all have um, different gases, the same types of gases dissolved in them and also in the same amount. So if you take air from Africa and you also take air from Australia, they would not have any major differences. The main gases and the amounts will always be the same. So air is a homogeneous uh, a solution with a homogeneous mixture. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances which might be solid, liquid or gas or a mixture of these. So you can also have a liquid and a solid combined together forming a solution. So this, as you can see, so these are the main differences between a compound mixture and solution. Basically a compound is a pure substance. A mixture is made up of compounds, so it is made up of substances and a solution has to be a homogeneous mixture. So again, a solution is made up of compounds but it's homogeneous which means it has a uniform composition. So these are the main differences between compounds, mixtures and solutions. Now let's move on to question 7. Now question 7 tells you that if the solubility of nickel sulfate in uh, aqueous nickel sulfate is 41 grams per 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius, how might it be possible to prepare a supersaturated solution containing 43 grams per 100 gram of water? So what you want to do is the usual, so 25 degrees is room temperature, so at room temperature Nickel, uh, aqueous nickel sulfate can only dissolve 41 grams of solid but if you inc uh, but we want to dissolve more than 41 grams we want to dissolve 43 grams and how can we do that so if you can remember if you increase the temperature of a solution you can dissolve more solute in it so our step would be to increase the temperature of aqueous nickel sulfate so that instead of 41 grams, it can dissolve 43 grams of solid. So you can saturate the solution at 25 degrees, then warm it up. So what happens, you, you keep on adding um, solid to your nickel sulfate uh, and at one point your nickel sulfate cannot dissolve any more solid because it gets saturated. And what do you do then? At that time, you can warm it up, so you can put it on top of a Bunsen burner and you heat it up, you increase the temperature and that will actually allow it to dissolve more, more solute. So then 
the extra additional solute that you added to your solution that was not dissolving initially by increasing the temperature you can uh, dissolve that extra solid and then and then how do you know that the dissolved solid has actually um, the solid has actually dissolved in a solution what you do is when you cool it back down to 25 degrees Celsius the extra additional solid that you added should precipitate out so that confirms that initially the solid has dissolved and formed a supersaturated solution now let's move on to question 8 question 8 tells you to explain why water is called a universal solvent so again the verb is explain and now you need to relate the cause and the effect so you need to explain is water an universal solvent and if it is why it's called a universal solvent so as we know that in nature many substances dissolve in water to form aqueous solution so you can dissolve sugar and form a sugar solution that you can drink or we know that there's other substances for example the water in our body dissolves substances such as oxygen and carbon dioxide and it transfers it to different parts of the body so therefore many substances in nature dissolve in water to form aqueous solution so especially in biological systems cannot function properly without water as a solvent again we know that water acts as a very important solvent in our body it dissolves all types of materials such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, other types of nutrients, minerals and then what they do is they transfer it to different types of cells to different parts of the body and then the cells use them and, uh, uh, and performs a reaction and after the reaction the waste that cells form that waste is again dissolved in the water and carried to the other parts of the body where the waste can be excreted. Question 9 tells us to outline the importance of water as a solvent in living cells. So here the verb is outline which means you have to describe. You don't have to explain why that's the case. You only have to uh, list the properties of water that allows you, it to act as a solvent in living cells. So what properties of water allows it to act as a solvent? Water dissolves digested carbohydrates and proteins. So here the property of water is its ability to dissolve carbohydrates and proteins. So water dissolves carbohydrates and proteins and they are transported in solution in, uh, in the blood. So in this um, 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 uh, point you can see that the property of water is that its ability to dissolve carbohydrates and proteins and also water can act as a transport mechanism so in this point you can see two properties of water also carbon dioxide and oxygen are transported in solution in blood so water can also dis, uh, uh, dissolve carbon dioxide and uh, oxygen which are again um, transported to different parts of our body so again here water is acting as a transport agent also it shows the ability of water to dissolve gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. So this is the third property um, we are mentioning in this question for water. So the first was it can dissolve solids such as carbohydrates and proteins. So that's the first property. Our second property is it can act as a transport mechanism. So and our third property is it can also dissolve gases. So also, um, also um, notice that we are only listing the properties, we are not explaining them. So we are not actually explaining why water dissolves these different things. We are actually listing them because the question only tells us to outline. And the last point is waste can also be dissolved in water for excretion by kidneys and skin. For example, we produce urea as a waste product and that is dissolved in water and we excrete urea as urine which is a liquid. So uh, that's an example of waste dissolved in water in our body to be excreted from our body. Now let's look at question 10. Question, tells us, uh, question 10 tells us to identify what substances are soluble in water. Again in this uh, question it only asks us what substances so we need to provide a list of substances so you just need to recognize and remember the substances that are soluble in water. So we know ionic compounds are soluble in water, for example sodium chloride. Sodium chloride are present in the form of sodium ions and chloride ions in water. So sodium chloride is soluble in water. 
what about covalent molecular compounds? We also know that covalent molecular compounds such as ammonia, which is NH3, is uh, dissolved in, uh, uh, can be dissolved in water. So the ammonia molecule does not break apart into nitrogen ions and uh, hydrogen ions as ionic compounds. They, they remain as NH3. So that's why they're molecular compounds that can be dissolved in water. Also solute molecules such as sugar. Again, with sugar, the sugar molecule does not break apart. It remains as solid molecules and they are surrounded by water molecules and that's how they dissolve in water. And the last one is ions involved in biochemical reactions in living things. So ions such as sodium and potassium ions are dissolved in our, biology, uh, in our blood plasma and then they're used in biochemical reactions in living things. So as you can see, water can dissolve these four different kinds of solutions. Now this brings us to the end of our question session. In this topic, we looked at the major roles of water as a solvent in living things such as humans, us, as well as plants.